afternoon. Welcome to our Launch and Learn series. Today we have our visual archivist, Chris Nichols, and the name of the event is Exploring the Audiovisual Collections at the Archive. Please post your questions on the chat and we will uh, gather them and we will pass the questions at the end to Chris. So Chris, this is your event. Thank you so much for accepting the invitation. Thank you, Raul. Just want to make sure everyone can hear me. Uh, OK. Uh, hello, and welcome to Tune In, exploring the audiovisual collections at the archives. My name is Christopher Nichols, and I'm the AV archivist here at the New York City Municipal Archives. Uh, today, I will be highlighting our recently digitized and freely available audiovisual material. I'll be discussing the backgrounds of collections before sharing a number of selected clips to highlight some of the unique and historic material that we have available now. Since we only have an hour, uh, I'll just be showing parts of these clips, but you can watch them in full anytime on our digital platform, Luna, that I will be using throughout the presentation. From our NYPD surveillance film collections and our WNYC TV collection. We also have over 3,000 WNYC radio recordings online, but today I'm only gonna be discussing moving image material. We're still digitizing and adjusting thousands more WNYC films and radio recordings, and there are many other AV collections at the municipal archives that, have only just started to, that we only just started to get a handle on. Still, there are uh, more collections that we are in the process of acquiring, so there's much more uh, than just what I'm gonna be discussing today. Um, one, uh, one of the collections that we have already that we have started digitizing is the Municipal Broadcaster Channel L. Uh, another collection that we are working on a grant to digitize our Board of Education meetings on audio tapes from 1970 to 1996. Uh, we also have uh, Mayor Giuliani's radio show recordings that he made throughout his time as mayor um, and tons of other things. Uh, the primary preservation issues present in these collections are vinegar syndrome in the films and sticky shed syndrome in tapes. The collections go back to the 1940s, but it was usually decades before the material was transferred to the municipal archives. Even then, the moving image material was not kept in ideal storage conditions, accelerating degradation like vinegar syndrome and sticky shed syndrome. Uh, and once they, uh, sorry, uh, this year, they're gonna be moved to a state-of-the-art climate controlled facility that should prolong their life, their lifespans. Still, the items require a significant amount of care to properly digitize. The tapes in particular, a lot of them had to be baked. Um, and we, uh, we did a lot of vinegar syndrome testing uh, to decide which films to digitize first. Uh, so the first collection we'll be exploring is the NYPD surveillance film collection. All the films in this collection have been digitized. They amount to about 75 hours of content. For reference, the nine season television series, The Office is about 74 hours now. Uh, these films were created from 1960 to 1980 by plainclothes police officers. We have very little internal documentation about why certain groups or people or sites or events were chosen for surveillance. The only official document uh, that the Municipal Archives has from the NYPD is a logbook that the Bureau of Special Services, uh, or BOSS, used to assign new surveillance orders. The information is rarely more than a street address, date, and name of the officers uh, assigned to filming, but there are also occasionally names or movements uh, or specific events like gay liberation or Rockwell bus strike. On top of the activist groups, uh, highly public individuals were also recording these surveillance films, including uh, every president, except for Ford for some reason, uh, civil rights leaders like Malcolm X, New York City mayors, astronauts returning from successful missions and having their uh, ticker tape parade through downtown Manhattan, uh, Pope Paul VI on the first ever visit of a Pope to the Western Hemisphere, and a lot of other big public figures. Uh, keep in mind uh, that uh, with the number of high profile assassinations in the 1960s and the precarious presence of the United Nations in an increasingly dangerous New York, Boss had an interest in ensuring the safety of foreign figures like President Tito of Yugoslavia or Pope Paul VI. There were real questions about whether the United Nations should have been moved from the city of New York because of the rising crime rate. Uh, so, uh, a lot of, so some of the surveillance was indeed to provide security for foreign dignitaries. At the same time, 
uh, Boss was intensely surveilling domestic figures around the time that they were killed. Two of NYPD's Malcolm X films were recorded less than a month before his death, and several JFK films were recorded uh, two weeks before his death. Uh, so what was the Bureau of Special Services or BOSS? Uh, the Bureau was, a was the surveillance wing of the NYPD, which still exists in different forms today. It has a long history complicated by the many different names it has operated under over the last century. Some of the knowledge we have about BOSS comes from a book by former NYPD officer Anthony Buza titled Police Intelligence, the Operations of an Investigative Unit. According to Buza, uh, BOSS was at its height in the 1950s dismantling efforts by groups like the Minutemen to blow up the Statue of Liberty's arm with dynamite. Buza believed that the organization lost its way in the 1960s and ultimately left the NYPD in 1975. In 1971, 21 Black Panther members were tried on a plot to blow up a police station and several businesses in the city, but they were quickly acquitted. During this trial, the extent of NYPD surveillance and infiltration of political groups and members first became public. This later led to a class action lawsuit by a range of political activists, which resulted in the 1985 Hanshu Agreement, named after the lead plaintiff, Barbara Hanshu. This agreement placed limits on, uh, on NYPD surveillance activities, but its provisions have been steadily weakened since 2002. Uh, so the, the Bureau began uh, as the Radical Bureau in 1912 to investigate the status of resident aliens. It's had a lot of different names, uh, Neutrality Squad, Radical Squad, Bureau of Criminal uh, Alien Investigations, Public Relations Squad. For a long time, its explicit mission was to uh, find communists in the United States, people with uh, far left socialist leanings uh, who might be uh, working for foreign governments. Um, but as I said, its mission evolved a lot over the years. The, uh, the largest subjects that we have available in the 1960 to 1980 films are first off the civil rights movement. Uh, I mentioned that Malcolm X appears. Coretta Scott King also appears. Uh, the NAACP and Congress of Racial Equality appear over and over again. Uh, there's a lot of, of recordings about the Black, pa Black Panthers in the later 60s, as well as the Nation of Islam. Um, and the AFL-CIO was present uh, at a lot of these protests. Um, after the Civil Rights Movement, the Vietnam War, actually that might be, the Vietnam War might be, uh, have more films uh, than the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, the groups that show up in the Vietnam War protests over and over again are groups like Youth Against Foreign Fascism, Student Peace Union, Students for Democratic Society, Vets for Peace in Vietnam, uh, Bread and Puppet Circus. Uh, but you might also see in some of these films that, uh, that I'll be showing that the Vietnam War protests ended up being um, attracting a lot of different uh, groups, a lot of different uh, causes that saw a common cause in ending the Vietnam War. Um, so it's not just these groups that are explicitly involved in any that in explicitly involved in protesting the Vietnam War, but other groups that see the Vietnam War as another sort of uh, chapter in global colonialism. Uh, so we also have a lot of films about uh, the United Nations and protests for or against uh, different countries around the world uh, regarding Cuba. Uh, so we have a lot of protests from people protesting against Castro. We also have other people protesting against the embargo, uh, the Soviet Union, Israel, Palestine, uh, China, Taiwan, Yugoslavia, Syria, Ukraine, Dominican Republic, Poland, um, you name it. Uh, there are also a lot of smaller subjects. Um, the previous subjects, there are maybe several hundred of, uh, but the NYPD was, um, they, they surveilled a lot of different groups, groups that you might be pretty surprised about. Um, after Stonewall in 1969, we start seeing um, mentions of gay liberation within the NYPD surveillance logs. Um, so it did seem like after Stonewall, there was a recognition that uh, what, what the NYPD referred to as gay liberation uh, potentially posed a security threat to the city. Um, there's also a lot of films about just Puerto Rican cultural events, the Puerto Rican National Day Parade and the San Juan Fiesta Parade. Um, as far as I can tell from the films, there doesn't seem to be a particular uh, security threat. There is in one of the San Juan Fiesta parades, though, um, there's a clear, there's a, a float uh, advocating for the release of several uh, Puerto Rican uh, uh, independence activists who had fired upon uh, congressmen in the 1950s. Um, there are also some, some smaller 
really unique things um, that, as far as I know, uh, virtually no one has heard about. Um, the first of which being Veronica Lucan, uh, who was also called the Seer of Bayside Queens. Uh, she believed in the 1970s and 80s uh, that the Virgin Mary was communicating um, messages to her about the about Vatican II, uh, which was a really big shift in uh, how Catholicism organized itself during the 1960s. Um, there's also the closure of Sydenham Hospital, which in uh, the late 70s um, closed down. Basically, it was the largest hospital in Harlem. Uh, it resulted in a, a, an occupation by Harlem residents that lasted for days. Um, there's also lots of uh, astronaut ticker tape parades. Again, I think that that's interesting because this was an NYPD surveillance film uh, collection. So these were um, ostensibly created with, uh, with the thought of ensuring the safety and security of the people of New York. Uh, and so there were a lot of astronaut ticker tape parades that were also recorded. Um, so with that, oops, sorry about that. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing this and I'm going to share a different screen to start playing some of these films. So this is Luna. This is our platform where you can find all of the films online. Uh, all of the NYPD surveillance films are three minutes long. They're black and white and they're silent. Um, so I'll talk over it a little bit. Uh, this is one of the earliest films that features Malcolm X. Um, he's at a protest um, against uh, Downstate Hospital uh, construction. A lot of different uh, construction sites were protested against because uh, even in the 1960s, uh, even in the 1960s, in the 1960s, they were still using uh, sometimes unions that uh, only had white laborers that didn't allow people of color uh, to work in them. So they were protesting uh, the construction of using uh, only white labor. And I think sometimes as you're watching these, keep in mind, this isn't a bystander recording this. This is someone who, this is a, a, an NYPD officer. They are dressed like a bystander in order to uh, make sure that no one knows that they're being surveilled. Um, but yeah, this is the NYPD recording this. There's Malcolm X you see in the middle there. Um, the NYPD is recording this because they've, they've identified that the protest taking place is a potential security threat uh, to the people of New York. One thing I'll just note is that uh, these are actually really well shot. Um, most of the films are of this quality. Um, they did a good job at uh, lining up uh, people's faces, signs, um, they did a good job of, of making sure to record the things that they thought were really relevant to them. Uh, and there's also other uh, news cameras there at the time. Um, so you can see some of those other cameras uh, are from a uh, news chain. Uh, so the next one I'm gonna show you is from another protest of uh, Rochdale Village, uh, which is still a housing cooperative in Queens. Um, at the time of its construction, it was one of the largest housing cooperatives. Uh, it, um, again, like with the, the last film, it was using only white labor, but the housing cooperative was supposed to be racially integrated. Um, it, the protest of this uh, took place in the summer of 1963. At the time, it was the longest protest that the NAACP had engaged in the state of New York. Um, this is one of the largest series of civil rights protests that we have. Um, I think that there's, um, there's at least 30 films, uh, 33 minute long films uh, from, of just this protest alone. Um, I'm gonna point out one person in a little bit here um, who was the president of the NAACP, William H. Booth at the time. He would go on to become uh, a judge. Uh, he also sat on Mayor Lindsay's Human Rights Commission uh, in the late 60s. Um, I also really want to just mention again, um, this uh, also actually here, take note that there are children in the background. Um, the people who are actually putting their, their bodies in danger are 20s, 30s, 40s. 
There are children and older people in the background. This is a community event. You'll see why I'm emphasizing that in a little bit. So the man with the tie is William H. Booth, the man who looks like he's sort of organizing other people and talking with them. So this is being recorded by a plain closed officer. Just, I I'm really want to emphasize that. Uh, this is an NYPD officer who came to record this event. Um, you can see that there are families um, in the background. This is a neighborhood that is doing something very dangerous and very brave um, in front of their families. Um, it feels a lot like these are home movies sometimes. So this is also one of the most personal films I feel to me because it's pretty clear that the NYPD officer who was recording this used the first two minutes to record this NAACP, NAACP protest uh, and then stopped filming, went back home and used the last minute to record a whole movie of his family. Um, so this film particularly always really sticks out in my mind when I think about this collection um, because it, it, you couldn't have, you couldn't have planned such a, an incredible um, juxtaposition uh, between the families uh, protesting against segregation and discrimination and hiring practices, um, and then this family uh, playing in their backyard. Um, there are a lot of things like that where the NYPD officers uh, will stop recording what they've been assigned to and use up a little bit more of the film to record things inside their offices um, or uh, just sort of having fun. Most of them are not like that, but there, there's a few of them. So here's uh, moving on to our uh, Vietnam War protests. Uh, this is 1965. Um, you can see Youth Against War and Fascism is the name on a lot of these signs. Youth Against War and Fascism shows up repeatedly throughout all the Vietnam War protests. They were very, very active. Um, this is obviously under Johnson, um, but there's protests. Um, throughout the 60s and the early 70s. Um, I think I, I mentioned earlier that the Vietnam War protests are probably the biggest collection. It's maybe two to 300 films. Uh, the civil rights protests are more like one to 200 of the films in here. Um, like I said, for time purposes, I'm just gonna jump around a little bit. Um, here is a later protest. Uh, the Vietnam War. Um, you'll see a lot more groups, uh, of disparate groups uh, with their own reasons for protesting against the war coming together. Um, and you can see uh, some of those signs uh, linked uh, Vietnam with the violence in Watts. Um, so there were, and then this is a trade unionist uh, for peace in Vietnam as well. Um, there's also this artist group, uh, the Bread and Puppet Circus, uh, that would, uh, Bread and Puppet Theater, that would put on these elaborate shows uh, during anti-Vietnam War peace parades um, to raise awareness of what was happening in Vietnam. And this is actually still pretty early on in the Vietnam War. This is from the mid 60s. So this is moving on to the uh, United Nations theme protests. Um, these are two protests that were taking place across the street from each other, um, a uh, Taiwanese and communist China um, protest groups uh, who opposed each other. A lot of the time they'll, the NYPD would start out with a, a cross street um, to just give um, a reference point.
And so this is 1971, uh, September 21st. And there you can see the Communist China uh, Maoist faction on the other side. Uh, and then early on in 1963, um, this is one of the films that I was talking about uh, that shows uh, John F. Kennedy just about two weeks before his death uh, later that year, 1963, November 22nd. Um, he had come to the United Nations to meet with the president of Yugoslavia, uh, uh, Tito. Uh, people protested against Tito being there um, because he'd been killing many, many people. So um, yeah, JFK had no idea that he was being surveilled by the NYPD at this point. As far as I know, neither did the Secret Service. Um, this was entirely something that the NYPD did on its own. Um, again, they were intent on protecting uh, foreign dignitaries, on uh, domestic figures. Um, it's just fascinating to me that this is, uh, yeah, this is just two weeks before JFK died. Um, and we have several, several other films uh, showing JFK around this event uh, shortly before his death. Um, so moving on to the smaller subjects, um, I'll show you this entire film. Um, this is a protest, this is a, a so-called gay liberation demonstration at the New York City Board of Examiners. Um, they were protesting in part that um, people who were openly gay were not uh, being allowed to become teachers. And so this is the Gay Activist Alliance. The Lambda symbol uh, was something that they had adopted as their symbol. Uh, there are a few other Gay Activist Alliance uh, protests that we have later on. You can see this is getting actually pretty violent. Uh, they later storm into the, uh, into the hotel that they're protesting in front of um, and uh, got a lot of headlines. You can see there's also uh, news reporters uh, outside of the crowd. Uh, one thing that I notice in a lot of these films is the presence of uh, trade unions. Uh, unions uh, seem to have supported a lot of different causes in a lot of different ways. I'm not sure if looking at protests today that I see a lot of union representation, not on the same scale as I saw in these films. Um, but it, it's also something I have to remind myself that um, these films are not representative of what was happening. These are films that are representative of what the NYPD was concerned about. Uh, so moving on to something really different. So this is the San Juan Fiesta. It takes place in late June of every year in New York City. Uh, I mean, it's not only in New York City, uh, it's also celebrated in Puerto Rico, um, but it started to be celebrated in the early 1950s um, when New York City's uh, Puerto Rican population started to grow significantly. Um, I show it uh, partly because it, it is just a great film. Uh, we have, I think, 12 films. Uh, from this particular event. Uh, the NYPD surveilled um, 
this event and also National Puerto Rican Day parades pretty consistently for years. Um, none of them have any kind of uh, like violence or protests around them, unlike the last film uh, where we saw that uh, it, it sort of made somewhat sense that the NYPD would be interested uh, in surveilling uh, a, a protest that then sort of did get out of hand. This is just a cultural event. Um, again, we don't have that much documentation, so I can't really comment that much more about why they were surveilling this event. Um, but you'll see that there's you know, a lot of uh, really great floats, um, a lot of representation of uh, cultural dress or uh, traditional dress, uh, modern uh, like uh, firefighters and NYPD organizations that also uh, marched in this parade. Um, but yeah, we just, we have hours of that. We have hours of footage of different Puerto Rican cultural parades and masses and events. Um, getting to something a lot more obscure, uh, this is footage from one of Veronica Lucan's vigils. Um, it's something that I've thought about a lot. So I mentioned that Veronica Lucan was someone who uh, was getting messages from the Virgin Mary in the 1970s about uh, how wrong uh, the Catholic Church was to, inst to institute the reforms of Vatican II. Um, she was referred to as the Bayside of, of uh, the, sorry, the Seer of Bayside Queens, uh, where she lived. Um, her her messages became so popular that hundreds of people would come to her vigils on a regular basis. It started to cause real concerns for her neighbors because there were just hundreds of people every Sunday that were showing up uh, to worship at her house. Um, originally, she had tried to get people to worship at a local cathedral in Bayside, Queens, uh, but the cathedral uh, decided to reject her because she was basically um, against the Pope and the Vatican. Um, a lot of her uh, she continued um, receiving and communicating her messages for a long time. Um, over time, those messages started to become a lot more elaborate, um, including uh, ideas about the Pope um, being held captive underneath the Vatican uh, by a satanic sect, that the Pope that you would see on TV uh, just had some plastic surgery and was not the real Pope, uh, that the, the Vatican was being controlled by um, demonic aliens that had come from the center of the earth. Um, I, like I said, I think about that a lot more. Um, So another, um, so this is a pretty rare film. This is from the NYPD collection in that it's in color. Um, it is a ticker tape parade of the Apollo astronauts uh, returning from their successful mission um, and going down the Canyon of Heroes in downtown New York. Um, this just, like I said, like I've said before, we, we don't have documentation to explain why the NYPD conducted surveillance uh, on, on different events. Um, it's, it's strange to me that they got a uh, color film for this. Uh, this was also an event that was documented by the late, the next uh, collection that we'll look at WNYC TV. Um, but yeah, it, it sort of just seems like the NYPD uh, used their surveillance arm to record this uh, really high profile event. Um, the other explanation would be that there were security threats against the astronauts. Um, I think that that would be fascinating to, to learn about if there were attempts or if there was an interest by people to uh, to murder people like Buzz, Buzz Aldrin um, in a public parade like this. That sounds kind of crazy, but again, you know, this is 1969. It's only a few years after John F. Kennedy was shot publicly. Um, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. had also been killed. Robert Kennedy had been killed. Uh, maybe not by by this date, but soon. Um, so it's not totally inconceivable that for some reason, someone would want to assassinate astronauts getting during a parade. Um, and here they are speaking with Mary Lindsay. Again, it's very well shot. They did a good job. Okay. So returning to
so the other collection that we have a lot of moving image material uh, online is uh, the WNYC TV collection. Uh, WNYC was founded in 1922 as a municipal radio station and first broadcast in 1924 on the frequency 570 AM. In cities across the country uh, in the 1920s, frequencies were set aside in anticipation of municipal television channels as the technology was still being developed. Although the first television broadcast occurred in 1928, the Great, Depression, uh, the Great Depression forced most municipal governments across the country to sell off the rights to frequencies uh, set aside for public broadcasting. New York City was one of the few places to maintain those rights, which allowed, w <clears throat> which allowed WNYC to expand into television and to create such a robust public service for the city throughout the 20th century. Under the Giuliani administration, the channel was spun off from the city and now exists as the WNYC Foundation with the television broadcast rights going to WPXN-TV. Uh, in the collection itself, there's over 6,000 films uh, and, uh, and videotapes. Uh, 1,500 of the items have been digitized so far. It amounts to about 500 hours that are available online. The films are primarily 16 millimeter Kodachrome with sound and color. The videotapes are mostly beta cam, three quarter inch schematic, and a little bit of one inch open reel. Uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the footage. Um, is uh, from broadcast ready television shows, uh, but most of the footage is from B-roll and camera original footage that never aired. So for example, uh, there's a 25 minute episode of the show Neighborhood Voices that has uh, actually over five hours of associated B-roll uh, and interviews that were shot uh, for this 25 minute program that were just never shown on TV. Uh, unlike the videotapes, most of the films are not television series, but interviews with city officials uh, on votes, appointments, city policy, investigations, potential legislation, uh, all of it taking place inside City Hall and the municipal building. City council members like President Carol Bellamy can be seen advocating for a gay rights bill in the late 1970s, while other city council members disagreed within the hall at halls of the municipal building. Uh, many films of Mayor Beam consist of press conferences communicating the dire nature of the city's finances in the mid-1970s. Uh, still other films document uh, ticker tape parades for astronauts, celebrations for different holidays, and promotional films for the city and public service announcements. Uh, so this is a great resource uh, for just the history of uh, local politics in the city of New York. Um, it has press conferences from every mayor, uh, from tons of city council members, um, about a lot of different uh, uh, public policy issues that were going on at the time. Um, I think that this is actually really interesting to compare it to the NYPD films, which, as we just saw, uh, as I just explained, uh, documented or uh, recorded a lot of public figures like Mayors Wagner, Lindsay, Bean, and Koch. Uh, sorry, not Koch, um, but Lindsay, Bean, Wagner for sure. Um, and it's, it's fascinating to, to see that um, these two different bodies of municipal government were uh, creating um, these visual records for very different reasons in very different contexts. Uh, so the video programs, uh, the ongoing program, the ongoing series uh, that make up the bulk of the videotape uh, footage uh, were New York Hotline, which was a, a call-in uh, panel talk show uh, that lasted for each episode being an hour. It went from 1990 to 1996 uh, with hosts like Brian Lehrer, uh, Maria Inahosa, uh, and Bob Herbert. Um, a lot of their topics would be, well, I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, another series was Neighborhood Voices that aired in 1986 uh, that highlighted a lot of uh, endangered or changing New York City neighborhoods. Another series, Part of the City, did much the same, uh, highlighting different aspects of the city, uh, hosted by JFK Jr. Another series called In the Mix was uh, made for and by teens uh, to just talk about um, different issues of the day, uh, like uh, condom use, HIV, AIDS, um, school bullying, um, things like that. Uh, Flashpoint, which was like a crossfire style debate show with someone on the left and someone on the right. Uh, New York City Votes 1988, which is what it sounds like. It was a program that was funded by the League of Women Voters. Uh, it uh, had a short like 25 minute debates between uh, different people running for local government in New York City in 1988. Uh, Poetry Spots, uh, which was um, a short-lived uh, program uh, that uh, highlighted different um, 
poetry by pairing live readings with uh, sort of uh, music videos, but with poetry uh, included people like Allen Ginsberg. Um, so limited specials uh, were sort of uh, short documentaries or a series or limited series of documentaries like Endangered Our, Our Urban Environment that investigated things like um, uh, oil spills in the city, uh, garbage, uh, different, aspects, different ways of pollution, none of which were climate change. Um, another series was Mandela, The Last Mile. Uh, Nelson Mandela visited New York City after, his, um, after he was freed from captivity. Uh, there's a lot of videotapes about Nelson Mandela's visit, a lot of different events, uh, him speaking at Yankee Stadium, different schools around the city, um, speaking at the UN. Um, Kristallnacht, More Than Broken Glass, uh, that was, uh, came out in 1988, which was the 50th anniversary of Kristallnacht, the night of uh, basically terror against uh, Jewish Germans living under the Nazi regime. Uh, they, those are a lot of interviews um, with uh, people who survived it. Uh, again, uh, the, the program is about an hour long, but there's many more hours of interviews that just never aired because they didn't make it into the final program. And then we also have hours of the Mayor Dinkins inauguration um, that we have. Uh, we have two hours of the Giuliani uh, inauguration, but there's some issues with it, so I didn't mention. Uh, the major subjects, uh, like I mentioned for the video series, like I mentioned, uh, people like Nelson Mandela, David Dinkins, John F. Kennedy Jr., uh, Thelonious Monk Jr. Uh, is interviewed in Neighborhood Voices. Um, a lot of the current affairs, th uh, this is particularly that New York hotline covered uh, HIV AIDS crisis, uh, affordable housing, gender equality, immigration, substance abuse, uh, education, racial discrimination, changing our endangered city neighborhoods. Um, some high profile stories of just uh, things that were um, widely talked about during the 90s, um, uh, Central Park Five, the savings and loans crisis, the murder of Yusuf Hawkins, um, NEA funding in the wake of uh, scandals to do with Mapplethorpe and, uh, and Serrano. Um, and so now I'll go to sharing some of these videos. Uh, they all have audio on them. And like I said, I'm gonna be jumping around a little bit because we just don't have time to, these videos are all a lot longer. So the first video is uh, Muhammad Ali. Um, he fought against Ken Norton in uh, 1976. Um, this was a big event for the city. Uh, so this is him doing a promotional event. And I thought I would just highlight this one, this particular clip, because if you don't know this about Muhammad Ali, he is really, really, really good at smack talk. Um, and pretty much uh, every, I don't know, uh, sports figure, uh, Popular figure who is well known for smack talk today, I think, is borrowing from Muhammad Ali. I haven't convinced these suckers yet. I destroyed George Foreman. I destroyed Joe Frazier. This man came up George Foreman. This man came up Joe Frazier already. Excuse me, Mayor. Already, already he's ducking George Foreman. They said. His managers just got through saying, after we get the title, we're going to defend against people like Jimmy Young and Dwayne Bobby. Already they're ducking George Foreman. If that sucker is lucky enough to beat me, shouldn't he fight George Foreman? Why is he ducking George Foreman? He's already a tramp. He ain't no champ. Ran his job and making a business out of it. I'm a champion. I fight everybody every month. All of them, bar none. This sucker's already ready to duck George Foreman and they're making all these X-rated movies. I don't want no world champion making no X-rated movies. I'm gonna destroy him. We got too much crime. We got too much juvenile delinquency. We got too many rapes. We got too much trouble to have a world champion and a movie with his behind out on the screen. Uh, so in addition to him being really good at smack talking, he also um, uh, was a really good advocate for, uh, for community problems in New York. Um, I didn't show it, but the NYPD also has a surveillance film of Muhammad Ali. Uh, the next one I'm gonna show is uh, the announcement, uh, Shirley Chisholm's announcement that she's running for presidency. This is a clip that we had available uh, earlier, but we only had a videotape transfer. So this is the first time that we can offer actually a really high quality version of this clip. 
I stand before you today as a candidate for the Democratic nomination for the presidency of the United States of America. I am not the candidate of Black America, although I am Black and proud. I am not the candidate of the women's movement of this country, although I am a woman, and I'm equally proud of that. I am not the candidate of any political bosses or fat cats or special interests. I stand here now without endorsement from many big name politicians or celebrities or any other kind of prop. I do not intend to offer to you the tired and glib cliches which for too long have been accepted part of our political life. I am the candidate of the people of America. And I, I just want to say, uh, I want to note that the WMIC TV films uh, were digitized by Carolyn K. Oliveira. Uh, Carolyn, if you're watching right now, thank you very much for that. Uh, so moving on to the videotapes, um, I have, uh, this is a New York hotline. Uh, we just have a few excerpts. I'll just show one of them. Uh, this is a video that the city made, uh, or sorry, this is an episode that the New York Hotline uh, used to focus on the development of HIV AIDS treatments in 1991. Uh, the eventual, what, what's sort of called the, um, the AIDS cocktail uh, that significantly reduced uh, deaths from HIV AIDS uh, didn't become available until about 1996. Uh, so this is still, I think that 1991 at the time was the highest uh, death count. So it's just this. Louis, we've had one drug fully approved for treating AIDS in the 10 years of the epidemic. That's AZT. Is this good progress? It's remarkable progress in the fact that it has happened within the time frame, not of 10 years, but really a shorter time since the virus was actually identified. And therefore, I think that you have to start from then. Just this last week, we've had in a, a, a move for limited, uh, for limited use, rather for AZT failures or AZT intolerance. That's that DDI, is the IDI, right? DDI. And I think that there is, uh, that, that now represents a, a tremendous advance, hopefully, in terms of our being able to offer more kinds of therapy for patients. And we'll talk more about DDI as the hour goes on. Alden, in your opinion, have we made reasonable progress in the last 10 years or could a lot more have been done? Well, I, the answer to that question, I think, depends on your frame of reference. My frame of reference is that of a person who has suffered from immune compromisation beginning in 1980. Um, and as I look at the situation, I see, I see a very different picture. Um, I see one drug approved, that's AZT, which as far as I'm concerned, the most favorable thing that can be said about AZT, looking at the data that's available is it helps some people for a limited period of time. Um, it did not help me. I am a person who is AZT intolerant, meaning that um, my, what it did for me was it basically dropped my white blood cell count through the floor. Um, so I am one of those people that needs something else, and I, there are a lot of people who are in that same situation. Um, but is it reasonable to expect that something else would have been approved sooner? Well, again, it depends on what your frame of reference is. If your frame of reference is the typical uh, path of a pharmaceutical project, product through research and approval by the FDA and marketing, you would say that AZT went very quickly. If your frame of reference is of a person who has a disease that is potentially fatal and needs uh, a treatment, then the progress is incredibly slow. And it has been our position in ACT UP uh, for a very long time that the process needs to be sped up given the nature of this disease. People who are facing a fatal disease ought to have access to drugs while they are still technically experimental. Uh, 
So that was from New York Hotline. Um, that is probably the longest running, uh, the, the series that we have the most episodes of. Um, a lot of them were hosted by, by Brian Lair, like I mentioned earlier. Um, all of these episodes would be an hour long, um, and we have a lot of B-roll associated with them. So there's uh, many, many hours of, uh, of footage from, from that series. Uh, the next one I'm going to show you requires a little bit more introduction. So this is from a series called Neighborhood Voices. It was a, a limited series that um, showcased a couple of different neighborhoods around the city of New York. Uh, one of them was called San Juan Hill. If you're not familiar with that neighborhood, it is, uh, it is what uh, Lincoln Center is now today. Um, in the 1940s, it was designated a slum. Uh, under Robert Moses uh, in order to clear it so that uh, they could build Lincoln Center. Sorry, that was in the 1930s. It was delayed because of the Second World War. Uh, after the Second World War, uh, the construction began. Um, San Juan Hill was, uh, was a, an Afro-Caribbean neighborhood. It's also uh, has the Phipps and Amsterdam houses, which were the first affordable housing units in the country. Um, in one of those buildings, uh, Thelonious Monk was born and grew up. Um, so this is an interview with Thelonious Monk Jr., uh, his son, a few years after Thelonious Monk died, <clears throat> his son was trying to set up, or successfully set up, uh, a music education program in Martin Luther King Jr. High School uh, in, uh, in San Juan Hill. Um, and here he's discussing his experience of the neighborhood and how that's changed. Um, tell me who you are and... Um... Growing up in the neighborhood. Who I am and growing up in the neighborhood. Well, I'm Thelonious Monk Jr. And uh, boy, growing up in the neighborhood. When I go back to the neighborhood, my first recollection of the neighborhood, wow, was an old woman from, I believe she was from Jamaica, right? And uh, we were living in 243 in the Phipps houses down there right across the street from the projects. And this woman had a milk, I don't even know what you would call it. I suppose it was a concession. She had a milk concession, right? In the basement of one of the uh, housing, of one of the housing project buildings, right? And I remember in the morning from the time I was very, very little, one of the daily operations of the whole entire neighborhood of all the kids was to get up in the morning and go get milk from Mabel. And it was very strange because, I mean, you could always go to a store. And I didn't really understand why everyone went to get this milk from Mabel, other than the fact that she was like 40 steps away in the nearest store, was uh, maybe two blocks away up on Amsterdam Avenue. But, and I remember that there were so many different kinds of people in the neighborhood. I mean, it was really, really incredible. You know, um, there was a time when the neighborhood down there for a moment seemed to become predominantly black. And now with Lincoln Center moving in, it's, it's beginning to really, really mesh again. But when I was a kid, which wasn't that long ago, I'm talking about the 50s, uh, there were so many different kinds of people. There were Puerto Ricans and Irishmen and blacks and Caucasians, and there was just everyone. And it was just a great, great neighborhood. We used to have a thing. <laughs> In the housing projects, I don't know. Are you from New York? No. Okay, well, in New York, at that time, they had some sort of urban uh, uh, programs to bring entertainment into, into the community. And there's a, there's a park, a playground down there that I believe you saw that when you were down there early this summer at the unveiling. And that playground served as like a, a community meeting place for a lot of things. And they used to bring a puppet show in. These things all seem very, very unusual to me because they didn't, you know, I also lived in the Bronx, you know, and I also lived in up to upper Manhattan, at, you know, for here and there, now and then, staying with relatives. And uh, it was amazing that these things seemed to go on in my neighborhood. Now, I didn't know what was so special about my neighborhood. There's a flagpole. <laughs> this is incredible. There's a flagpole in the housing project. They used to come in the middle of the summer. This truck would come and string up this gigantic movie screen on summer nights and show movies. And everyone would be out there. It was, it was such a community. It was just a, 
I thought it was a wonderful place. You know, I never thought of it as a ghetto or as a lower income, whatever. And of course, my dad, you know, he loved it so much down there that he would never, you know, when we finally moved away, it was more because he wanted a better place for his family to live. One of the last things that I want to show is uh, an example of um, uh, of tape baking. Uh, this tape was uh, was almost lost. Um, there was virtually nothing we could get from it. Um, it shows a lot of people reacting to a potential uh, gay bill of rights, so-called gay bill of rights that was passed uh, in 1986 um, in Greenwich. Um, I digitized the tape uh, before baking it. Uh, then I digitize the tape afterwards. On the left, you'll see before baking. On the right, you'll see after baking. Um, I don't know of any videos that sort of have this before and after comparison. Um, so I think it should be pretty nice for other AV archivists. <laughs> yeah. I wish they were open. I'm starving. Oh, those are great shoes. Nice. All right, you can pause and go. Okay, we were just basically asking um, today why, if you think that, um, why you think that third world people, Asians and Latinos and Chicanos and Black people don't get more involved in, uh, you know, the gay liberation movement, why it seems to be so white, you know? Well, I don't know much about that part. <laughs> I must say. Do you think that there's sort of just as much bad feeling to, about race in the gay community as there is in the with straight community? I would say yes to that one. Yeah. Um, the last film that I'm going to show, again, there's a lot of more interesting stuff. Um, the last one I'm going to show is just Nelson Mandela speaking at Yankee Stadium. Sorry, not film. Uh, this is a videotape. Uh, so this is from uh, 1990. Uh, distinguished leaders of the state of New York, Mayor Dingens, other leaders of the city of New York, sisters and brothers, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you the warm and fraternal greetings of the leadership and membership of our movement, the African National Congress. Again, I'd love to play along. But um, I know there's questions, and we don't have a lot of time left. Um, so I'll just end it there. OK. Thank you so much, Chris. Now I'm going to pass the mic to Latonia Jones for questions. OK, yes, we have plenty of them. So um, Bob asks, are there a body of film devoted to union demonstrations? I believe you covered some of that. Chris? Uh, there's a lot of union demonstrations. Um, in the NYPD films are the films that have a lot of union demonstrations in them. Um, it, it is, there are some of them that are definitely, the protests are being surveilled specifically because they are union demonstrations or they're labor rights organizations. Um, but then, like I said, there's also just a lot of labor unions that show up at a lot of different protest events for other causes like the Vietnam War or like civil rights. Okay, and were these films sh um, shown, um, the NY NYPD in particular, edited at all? Is that something that NYPD did? Did they, did they edit them at all? Yes. Uh, I don't think so. I, the only film that looked like it was edited, uh, or, sorry, there were two films that looked like they were edited. One was the Apollo, Astro the Apollo 11 Astronauts. Um, that one was definitely edited. And then there was um, a, a large film uh, recording the Pope's, uh, the papal visit, um, that was definitely edited together. But otherwise, no, they're not edited at all. 
And Kevin asks, are there any records of the training materials for undercover officers who did the reporting? Not in these films. There might be somewhere else, but not, not these films. Rob asks, on the technical side, could you discuss the digital format that material was migrated to and why that format may have been chosen in terms of preservation and archival longevity, long-term accessibility? Uh, so they were all digitized uh, to um, ProRes uh, 4444 um, in 4K. Uh, for 16 millimeter films, that might be a little bit of overkill, um, but we did see a recommendation about um, using 4K for uh, Sorry, I'm thinking back now. Uh, for Kodachrome, for color uh, Kodachrome films, and that's the majority of our WNIC TV films are color Kodachrome. Um, so we've gone with 4K. You and Kevin asks. Um, I know there was recently a call for a public artist in residence to work with these materials. Um, can you tell us anything about what you, what you hope the artist will accomplish? Um, man, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested to see that, uh, if they want to work specifically with the moving image material. Um, I, I don't, I have, I have trouble. Sometimes I think that, the, that you could pair the NYPD films with a lot of radio programs really well. We have a lot of uh, radio programs, uh, people talking about civil rights, like, uh, uh, like President Johnson, um, Malcolm X or Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and this, the NYPD films are all silent. Uh, so I think that that could be really interesting. Um, bringing together these different um, uh, audiovisual collections that this, like I said, the city was creating uh, for very different reasons in very different ways, uh, but at the same time about the same events. And is there any evidence that NYPD systematically analyzed these films or were they held just in case for future evidence at a trial? That's a good question. Um, it's really hard for me to say anything definitively. Um, from what I've seen, the films are, the NYPD surveillance films are in really, really good condition. So good that I, from what I've heard anecdotally, it doesn't seem like they ever opened them. Um, I don't think that they were watched. It doesn't look like there's any kind of damage that you might expect from watching. Uh, there wasn't, they weren't that dirty. Um, so my assumption is they were recorded. Um, there, uh, if there weren't any criminal uh, proceedings that uh, might have used those films as evidence, then they just were never opened. And finally, are there any plans to um, exhibit these materials in the future in some other uh, format? Uh, I don't know what our plans are for exhibits in general right now. Um, the city is still slowly reopening. Um, so I think a lot of it will depend on that. We have had exhibits in the past about the surveillance program before the films were digitized or when uh, just a very small number of the films were digitized. Um, that was uh, um, unlike, called Unlikely Historians. Um, so I, I would encourage you to find, uh, there's, there are virtual versions of that online right now that go into, um, more aspects of the surveillance program and use, uses a lot of, um, uh, still image photography and a lot of other ephemera. And that was the last of our questions. Um, thank you, Chris. Uh, as people are mentioning, it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you to all the members of Doris who provided links to our resources online in the chat. And we are closing in on two o'clock. So thank you everyone for joining us. Raul. Thank you so much. And please don't forget to join us for our upcoming events. I shared the link on the chat and thank you for being with us today.